The argument that I struggle with when I hear short sellers saying Tesla has no moat, that to me is hugely misguided. If they achieve the metrics that they can with this battery technology on September 22nd, that's one hell of a moat. Battery day is soon approaching and I've got Rodney Hooper from RK Equity to give us some interesting perspectives on what to look out for. And remember, everything discussed is our opinion only and not financial advice. Rodney, let's just get straight into it. Battery day is coming up. I'm curious to know what surprises you see coming and what are you going to be looking out for during battery day? A lot of the motivation around uh, you know, battery day and, uh, and what Elon's trying to achieve centers around the semi. When I originally looked at the metrics of the semi and a lot of people commented on it, the mass didn't quite stack. You know, the semi was projected to cost around $180,000, $200,000. And if you looked at roughly two kilowatt hours per mile, you'd need around 1,000 uh, kilowatt hours as a battery pack size, which we discussed the last time. Yep. You know, looking at $125 per kilowatt hour as a cost, if you've got $125,000 sunk into just the battery pack it doesn't leave you for a lot of room for the rest of the vehicle and to make a margin so there were question marks raised and a, a lot of it centered around the fact that he needed a, an improvement in both cost and on energy density now they've acquired maxwell bought maxwell last year it, it centered around the potential for dry cell manufacturing and also the improvements that come along with that technology so Footprint size, you know, when originally when, when Tesla asked for permission and they were looking at about 30,000 extra square feet, I thought that's quite small, but it makes complete sense when you look at dry cell manufacturing without, you know, um, solvents, etc. Your footprint is a lot smaller, so you can actually produce a lot more cells in a smaller space. It's believed that, you know, that that technology can reach around 300 watt hours per kilo, which would be a good 20% lift on the existing cells that Tesla uses. And then we're talking about cost savings of 10 to 20% on top of that. And suddenly, if you can do that at $100 per kilowatt hour at the pack level, suddenly you're only talking about $64,000 to $80,000 sunk into the battery pack of a semi, which now leaves you with a lot of margin potential to actually hit the 500 mile range and also allow for a margin. So it also plays into the uh, Cybertruck as well, you know, trying to get to, you know, a cheaper Cybertruck with a reasonably sized battery pack. So this is hugely exciting. If, if, if it can be done, if we're talking about a 20% improvement in energy density and we're talking a 10 to 20% reduction in costs and a small footprint and speed at which you can manufacture the cells because it's done with dry cell technology. We really are talking about a game changer. So, you know, if VW talks about being two years behind Tesla now, <laughs> they will be light years behind if this is possible. And it, it also brings the whole ICE versus EV total cost equation right into the center because at these sort of metrics you don't need subsidies you're literally there and what are your thoughts in terms of the amount of raw materials that are going to be needed to make all these things happen you know you're still looking at potentially if tesla is going to sell more than a million evs next year and, and that's adjusting the semi to model three equivalents so just adjusting the packs they could potentially need as much as 90 gigawatt hours of battery capacity. And that would be translated roughly about 72,000 tons of lithium hydroxide, which is as big as the entire global market for battery quality lithium hydroxide this year. Wow. So that would be Tesla on its own. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying right now, I, I don't see the supply chains secured for those volumes. And I've not seen any announcements, so I, I can't see that it, it's, it's possible to achieve that uh, without actually making some moves. I haven't also translated the nickel requirements. Uh, you know, that might be possible because nickel's had a bit of a build in LME inventories this year. You could potentially draw down on those, but um, 
It's so looking doubtful for lithium. We're talking about all these things for Tesla, but Tesla's not the only game in town. So Tesla's looking to massively ramp just as the, all these other auto OEMs are looking to get into the game. So a lot of other companies always saw EVs as some kind of a fringe market relative to their mainstream internal combustion engine vehicles. So they look to largely outsource the raw materials supply chains. That's starting to change, but a company like Tesla, which is EV only, a company like Rivian, and if you look at, at GM, what they're looking at to do with their LG partnership in Michigan is the realization that raw materials are absolutely critical. They're not, they're not optional. It's not a good idea to outsource those to third parties. And Tesla has been on it. I mean, they are looking at the raw material side of it. But if Tesla is going to reach more than a million vehicles next year, which would be two times what is already an ambitious target this year, they are going to need to you know, make some bold moves. I would caution people who, you know, who are wondering why they wouldn't pivot completely away from Panasonic. And again, Panasonic is supplied by Sumitomo out of Japan. Sumitomo has deep entrenched lines into the supply chain for nickel. And also, I guess, lithium and the other components as well. So you can't just pivot away when, when things are well established, but you can obviously supplement and you know, expand on your own. I hate to use in catch words, but this would be a game changer if they produce what's possible here. This is why I like getting Rodney onto the show. This perspective gives you an amazing insight into the Panasonic Tesla relationship and goes well beyond the usual headlines that get thrown around. Anyways, let's get back to the interview. So on a final point, can you give us one last surprise that you think might happen at Battery Day? Okay, sure. We know the ambition is for one terawatt hour by 2030, which is in itself insane. I mean, that's literally half of what we've got forecast in terms of battery capacity, uh, you know, at that date is there's been radio silence on any material offtake agreements in the supply chain. We know we're looking at them and that's missing and it's a central ingredient. So there could be a surprise. They could actually substantiate to the market. Yes, we've got the technology. Here it is. This is what's possible. And now this is how we're going to ensure that, you know, our supply chain is, is airtight and how we're going to make it happen. The argument that I struggle with when I hear short sellers saying Tesla has no moat, that to me is hugely misguided. If they achieve the metrics that they can with this battery technology on September 22nd, that's one hell of a moat. It's, you're putting everyone else years behind you. If you can, in 2020, lay the foundation to getting to $100 per kilowatt hour at the pack level or lower, to without a doubt set the groundwork for EVs to be cheaper than internal combustion engines across a large range of mass of the mass segment of the market, then that changes everything and that's your moat. The other guys are outsourcing the cell technology. You know, there's a lot of noise being made about how, you know, the, the individual um, internal combustion engine, the auto OEMs are buying into different cell guys, but buying 3% and 10% and doing a JV is a long, long way from actually meeting the critical hurdles to making a competitive vehicle. So, you know, Europe, look, it's fantastic what they're doing. It's integrated. They're supporting mining. They're supporting cell manufacture. They're supporting vehicle production but it's still hugely reliant on subsidies. Europe is, you know, Germany is offering 9,000 euro subsidies. That's what's making them competitive, but those can't be there forever. The government will phase those out. They're likely to phase them out completely by 2025, but if Tesla can stand on its own two feet and do it now without subsidies, everything's gonna change. All right, so maybe let's just wrap it up for the time being and let's maybe further discuss this after battery day. Yes, it's, uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, fantastic if we can, uh, we can have something really positive to uh, report. Definitely. All right, thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Ivan. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed that discussion and a huge shout out to Philip, Marek, G-Skype and Kevin, along with all the other Patreons that make these episodes possible. So until next time, I'll see you guys soon.